Hello and good morning, kind friends and companions. As you probably saw from the thumbnail and title and stuff, today we are talking about armor. Now, armor, of course, comes in many, many different sizes and shapes and styles, but the one that I really want to tell you a little bit about is my absolute favorite, brigandines. Unlike a big, solid metal sort of breastplate, brigandines are made of smaller metal plates that are then riveted to an outer shell garment. Since they are made up of those smaller interlocking plates, you can achieve a much, much more fitted silhouette. It's also so much more flexible. It makes it so that it's a very flexible, comfortable garment that you have lots of range of motion in. And most importantly, in my humble opinion, they're absolutely gorgeous. Now, I'm sure that really practical outer materials like leather or sturdy cloth were often used as that doublet layer on the outside. However, there are absolutely definitely excellent examples of people using more interesting fancy materials like red velvet, for example. Lots of examples of those. And probably these are still flat lined with a more sturdy fabric so that it's still very functional. But I just, I really love that fancy aesthetic. Even if we ignore the fabric though, the rivet patterns alone are also just fantastic. There's this little pattern of three rivets together in little groups kind of scattered all over that I find just particularly lovely and it's one of the most common, which is great. Now, as I have undoubtedly demonstrated, brigandines are very, very cool. And I've wanted to make one for years, but it wasn't until I recently sat down and kind of thought about it and wondered what would a modern sort of interpretation of this be? Y'all know that I love to take historical and modern things and smash them together and see what comes out. You know, hopefully something that's really interesting and inspired by both. And you know, today's project is going to be no different. Thousands of years of armor development and evolution has led us to its modern descendant, the bulletproof vest. Bulletproof vests, in turn, are often, not always, but often made of Kevlar. Kevlar is a fabric. It's made of aramid. It's a particularly strong and heat resistant synthetic fiber. It can be woven in lots of different weights and a couple different weaves. It looks a little bit like silk. It has kind of that similar sheen to it, but it absolutely feels like a polyester. So each individual thread is pretty strong, kind of like silk, but the real ballistic strength comes from taking many, many, many layers of Kevlar and stacking those, those fabrics on top of each other to create a kind of armored stack plate thing. Sometimes additional materials are added into that to laminate the layers together and truly make it one solid unit. Fun fact, Kevlar is actually a very specific branded fabric. It's made by the DuPont company. The OG fiber was invented by a DuPont employee, Stephanie Kolek. I see a woman scientist and an inventor, and I have to share. If you are also into cool ladies doing badass stuff, I'd like to point you to Warriors, Queens, and Intellectuals on Wondrium, who are the very kind sponsors of today's video. They have a fantastic curated collection of long and short videos, everything from tutorials to documentaries. If you've heard of Great Courses Plus, this is like the grand next step, and Wondrium has all the videos that Great Courses did, plus tons more. All of the folks that are in this particular series I've been watching lately are absolutely just some of the most badass people, but I was particularly intrigued by the video about Joan of Arc. Thematically appropriate to this video, I'd wager she's one of those people that I've absolutely heard about over and over a million times, but didn't actually know any details about whatsoever. So it was really fascinating to hear about how she at an incredibly young age 
felt compelled to go and, and help King Charles take control of the throne. She helped fight in battles. She was there when the king was crowned. Just absolutely fascinating to learn about. I love learning new things and Wondrium is really really fantastic for that. Say for yourself with a free trial in the link down below in the description. I think you guys will love it. All right, back to this. It's, it's just very nifty. She worked on this synthetic fiber as well as others, kind of developing it over the course of like 30 to 40 years. And now Kevlar is used in all sorts of things like tires, which I think was what it was originally developed for, uh, speakers and cables, electronic stuff, music instruments. Uh, it turns out that a really strong, lightweight fiber has a lot of potential applications. But let's get back to our application, armor. <laughs> so I cut out some cardboard into 10 by 15 inch sections to match the Kevlar plates that I have. And then I started trying to fit those to approximate body shapes as best as I could anyway. I am lightly basing my design off of this Met Museum Caress. This armor is probably not something that started out as one cohesive unit. It just kind of is displayed that way, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter for our purposes since we're only focusing on one specific item within this whole set. For the skirt area, I wanted to try some solid panels, kind of like the Met piece, as well as a few collapsible versions, which seems to be a bit more common for your usual brigandine looks. I may have slightly misjudged the amount of needed cardboard for this, so it does get a little bit silly looking here, but bear with me. This at least gives me kind of a basic ballpark idea of what these two styles of skirt are gonna look like, especially once I take it off of the mannequin and put it on myself. The body proportion actually fit really surprisingly well right off the bat. I am really happy with that. Although the skirt definitely needs to have some more filled in with these little blank spots here on both sides. So our top side is mostly good to go, but we are going to need to spend a little bit more time on the bottom half. The Kevlar plates are about a quarter of an inch thick and they will do some light bending and flexing, which will of course be nice for getting it to curve around the shape of my body, but I'm not so convinced that I'm gonna be able to get it to do this really kind of complex and sharp curve that the bust section has. Uh, no way to know though until we at least give it a try. I very loosely traced out the pattern just in case I end up needing to recut this piece later on. So I am about 99% sure that this isn't gonna work, but I figure I have nothing to lose. Might as well give it a try just on the tiny chance that it does work out. I was really hoping that I could use my bandsaw for this project since cutting out all of these panels by hand would be an absolute pain. This though is a very different material than I've ever used on my bandsaw before. So fingers crossed for me that it works out. Well, uh, a little update later. It's very interesting when it gets cut. It gets very fuzzy on the edges here. Uh, so I will have to figure out what I'm gonna do about that. Now let's at least see if we're able to kind of do some some molding with a heat gun. The material that's been used to fuse these layers of Kevlar fabric together and make it into one solid plate is supposed to be thermally reactive. It's supposed to make it so that I can, with a little bit of light bending and heat, make it so that the material will stay in that bend once it's cooled off. Unfortunately though, it is just not enough. While I can do some bending, I can't get quite enough shaping to match that really sharp curve of the bust. It was worth a try though. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're going to have to cut these pieces up into two parts, kind of like a princess seam. Fortunately, I, I did plan for this. I did have an inkling that this might happen. So I still have plenty of room in this piece to cut out the necessary smaller pieces. Back to those fuzzy edges that I mentioned earlier, I'm really hoping that if it's anything like tear out when working with wood and the bandsaw, then adding tape underneath the 
the cut should theoretically help make it so that the edge is sort of secured and doesn't flare out as badly on the bandsaw. I think that painter tape is usually what people use here, but unfortunately all I have right now is packing tape, but it's worth a try. That did not work as well as I had hoped it would. The first cut I did actually looked amazing. Practically no tear out at all, very smooth and infinitely workable. But then the next several cuts I did using the exact same technique with the tape all had tons of tear out. The, the only thing that I can think of is that maybe that first cut was just, just happened to be perfectly at the right sort of angle. Kind of like when you cut fabric and sometimes you do it in such a way that it has tons and tons of fraying and sometimes not so much. It just kind of depends on the grain of your fabric. That's what I guessed happened. Just a bummer. It would have been wonderful if it had just worked. I did try a number of different things to get rid of those little fuzzy edges, but in the end I found that just cutting them with a pair of scissors seemed to work the best, so it's a little bit rough looking, but I think good enough for now. I decided that the Kevlar panels are just a little too thick to try and have overlap like that style of skirts at the beginning, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and cut those off. Instead, I fixed up the initial skirt style so that it fit better and then I mirrored it to the other half so that I could get a really good visual sense of what the actual finished cross is going to look like. The skirt needs maybe just a teensy bit more shaping at the waist to make it just a little bit smaller there, but we are incredibly close. Next, we're going to work on the cloth covering for those armored panels. I went ahead and took apart an old mock-up from my scrap bin and started draping it on the form, but my armor is made up of such large panels that I think instead of creating an outer shell like your typical brigandine style, Instead, it's basically just going to be a set of covered plates, not dissimilar to the Met Armor example, so at least there's that. Labeling all of the pieces with right, left, front, back is highly recommended, and maybe even making a few marks between the different pattern pieces to help make sure that you can align them back up with each other nicely later on doesn't hurt. Now we can safely take the whole mock-up apart, trimming away any of the excess tape from that fitting process. And I also went ahead and lined up the mirroring pieces together to verify that they are still relatively symmetrical to each other. Each of these pieces needs to be traced onto the Kevlar panels, and then I need to make sure that I actually double up correctly on all the right pieces, I don't miss anything. Then we're going to head back down to the birthday bandsaw, cutting all of these out. Sometimes it gave me a nice clean cut, sometimes a messy one that needed to be trimmed away, but on the whole, I am seriously so glad that I didn't have to cut all of these by hand using a saw myself. Now that each piece is cleaned up, I needed to figure out what I'm doing with all of the rivets. I do really like that triangle pattern with a set of three rivets together, so I cut out a bunch of little triangles, each one representing three rivets, and then I arranged them all over the armor until I was pretty happy with the placement and felt like it looked balanced. Then I made a template with three holes in it to mark each of the rivets in their, their little triangle locations. This wasn't a perfectly precise system, but I feel like it got me relatively close to making everything match up between the different pieces, like all of the different skirts. I wanted the pieces to kind of be the same on each one, keeping everything nicely uniform throughout. Unfortunately, I did not have a punch that would work on these panels to make holes, so I, I did have to pre-drill each of those rivet locations, and even then, I still needed to also use an awl to open up each hole enough to actually insert a rivet. Since these panels are made up of a bunch of very long fabric fibers, 
the holes want to close right back up immediately after being drilled, which makes getting rivets in very tricky. Eventually though, I did have everything drilled and all of the rivets placed. They are only here temporarily since I still need to add the outer fabric, the decorative fabric, but I wanted to verify that I had enough. I kind of wanted like a sneak peek preview of how it was gonna look in the end. So my fabric arrived that I was gonna use to cover the outside of these, a very beautiful like carbon fiber composite, you know, hybrid type fabric, you know, in red and blue. I thought it was gonna be gorgeous for that party color medieval look. As it turns out, while it's gorgeous, it is practically useless in terms of fabric. Like this would do terribly as a as a fabric that you actually sew with because it it wants to fall apart the second anything even a little bit catches it. Which makes sense. Now that I've kind of looked at it a little bit more and, and done a little bit more research, I realized that usually you glue it down to a hard surface, which then gets sealed with several layers of sealant. I don't know what I'm gonna do about this. In order to try and figure out a way around the stability issue, I ran to the fabric store and I found this iron-on vinyl material in both glossy and matte formats. So I cut a couple sample pieces off of fabric about maybe two inches bigger around on all sides than my little test cut off piece of the, the Kevlar. And then I applied the vinyl as per the instructions. I ironed it down with the paper backing between the fabric and the iron. You can really see here the stark difference between the area that I didn't iron versus the area that I did. It's almost like it slightly melted and fused with the fabric below it. I already know that one downside of this is gonna be that the fabric is not going to shift and stretch the way that it did before, but I am hoping that the trade-off in durability will be worth it. As I said before, I got a matte and a gloss version of this vinyl. You can see here how the vinyl on the right shines in the light, but after the two of these have been ironed on, there really isn't much of a noticeable difference anymore. I, I do know that the one with this really long <laughs> snagged piece of thread is the shiny version, but they're effectively the same in the end. The gloss one is maybe the tiniest tint shinier than the matte, but not enough for me to worry about, you know, stressing out whether I'm using the right one throughout the rest of this process. Now I need to decide which of the sides is gonna face outward that you see in the end, the original fabric or the added vinyl side. To help me choose, I made a sample version each way, which also gave me a chance to get a feel for how the wrapping is going to go for the rest of the armor. And personally, I really strongly prefer the look of the one with the fabric side facing outward. It's brighter, it allows the unusual lovely sheen of the fabric itself to shine through without a layer of like plastic over top. The fabric no longer snags and pulls when something rubs across the surface. And while having the vinyl on the outside might be a smidge more protective, I think it's good enough inside. So I was curious if the fabric would delaminate from the vinyl with movement. So I made another little test sample strip. This one had fabric, then vinyl, then fabric all laminated together. And then I gave it a very vigorous shimmy and shake, trying to be super rough with it to simulate several, several days worth of wear and tear. And while it's no longer as picture perfect, it still held up pretty dang well. So now I think we can go ahead and take those rivets and put them back out of the panel and set them aside for later. I cut out another piece of fabric about two inches bigger around than the plate, and then I did the same for the vinyl. You do wanna try and get your vinyl to be a little smaller than the fabric so that whenever you're fusing it to the, the fabric, you don't have any overhang that accidentally makes it stick to the ironing board. You also don't want it to be too much smaller because then you also might waste a lot of unnecessary fabric. So there's kind of a, a give and pull there. Also definitely do not let the iron touch the surface of the vinyl without the paper backing between them. 
it will absolutely stick to the iron instead of your fabric. Peeling the paper off to reveal the fused vinyl fabric surface is just simply top notch. Do you want to know what I just realized? I'm sitting here ironing the piece for that center back and I just remembered it's supposed to be party color. So it's supposed to be red on one side and blue on the other. So it's fine. I have enough. As long as I don't make this mistake too many times, I should have enough material. I just feel very silly. So I cut that first red piece down and then made a blue piece to match and then stitched them together to create the new center back seam. I don't really know this until later, but I do wish that I had reinforced them now and made that seam a little bit stronger by either felling it or adding a reinforcement strip along, the, along with some top stitching. I also discovered that there is a slight issue with the black carbon fiber threads they break when they're punched with the sewing machine. I decided to go ahead and redo this seam completely. I took out the first round of stitching by cutting it off and then sewed it again with a much wider stitch length as well as trying to really be careful about kind of sewing between the black threads rather than punching through them if I could. On the piece that I cut off, you can really see here these little black carbon fiber threads sticking up, being messy as all heck, so I'm glad I did this. I then sprayed the back piece with a fusible adhesive and then put the fabric on top and then ironed it once I was pretty satisfied with the location. The adhesive isn't exactly perfect, but it does help things stick together enough so that I can keep everything tidy as I'm trimming off the excess fabric and, and edges out of the way, getting it down to about an inch and a half or a little under four centimeters. At each of the corners, I folded the corner in first and then I did the long edges over it. Here's the result. It's looking pretty good. It's just kind of temporarily glued down in place until I can get those rivets put in and then I'll get all this covered up so it looks really nice inside and out. I really, really like this sort of chevron pattern that's happening. This is the center back. I'm going to try and do the same look on the center front as well. Put all the rivets back in using an awl to open the new holes as needed and I can already see that there is a little bit of distortion on the surface of the fabric from the rivets, but there, there really isn't too much that I can do about it other than hope that it'll all smooth out in the end once the plates are kind of curved in their final form. So with our first piece in place here, we now can kind of branch out and I know that this is going to be blue, I know that this is going to be red, and I, I know that I need to try and orient the fabric so that the the black and blue stripes are in the same orientation. So from here, this is kind of my key for building out as we go, at least for the all of the back pieces. When it gets to the front pieces, I'll probably flip it or, or switch it so that it's still a chevron like. It, it'll make sense, I think, once I, I get it all done. So here we are, gonna start wrapping up everything else. Now that I've done several miniature test pieces as well as the center back, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on how to go about all the rest of the armor. From ironing to wrapping to adding the rivets back in, the rest of this went pretty smoothly until I got to the upper front bust pieces. In my mind's eye, I did not love the idea of wrapping them as like separate pieces, so I was curious if I could maybe stitch them together into one piece. I did this little test sample to see if I could combine a straight and a curved edge, and it went okay. I, I think it'll be even better though on the actual one since it has less of a sharp curve than my sample did. I went ahead and drilled through the actual pieces and then stitched them together as thoroughly as I could. The bottom edge here will hopefully have a bit more of a curve to it in the end once I've had a chance to break it in a bit and let the heat conform it to my body, but so far this is looking vaguely my body shaped, which I think is about as much as I can hope for in this material. 
Covering this last piece is definitely an interesting challenge since it is multifaceted in shape rather than being nice and flat like everything I've done so far, but I think it turned out pretty nice. I, I did end up stitching a lot of the inner corners on all of the pieces to help keep everything secure since the rivets themselves don't actually go all the way out to the corners or to the edges, so it needed a bit of an extra hold. Speaking of the rivets, that is the next step. The rivets as they are are just a little bit too long so I did have to trim them down so that they stood out of the backing by maybe only a quarter of an inch or so. A washer, or apparently it's called a burr when you're riveting, gets added on top of that and then using a ball peen hammer you want to try and round out or mushroom out the top edge of that rivet using lots of very light small tap 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 hits. Once the burr is secured down enough that it's not going to come back off, you can then switch to much harder hits using the flat of the iron to really smush down the rivet flush as, as best you can. I've got to say, even just one panel in and I was already kind of over this. Thank goodness I had Mr. Morgan Donner helping me out. There were well over 200 rivets in total in this project, so we each did about 100. The last step is straps to help connect all of these different armor pieces together. I have these four little bronze historical buckles. Unfortunately, I do need more than just four, so I went ahead and used some of these spare suspender sliders from the Victorian Punk Pants project. I figured out that if I cut one of the loops short, it basically becomes a buckle. Next is getting out my roll of leather that I've had for a million years at this point. I'm going to mark out several widths on the leather using an awl. You can use a marker, but I like using an awl because that works well enough. Then I'm going to cut them out using leather shears. Once I had all my pieces cut out, I could then dye them black with some leather dye. I figure that'll look really nice with the black of the carbon fiber threads on the, that cover fabric. We are all dyed up. I probably should have worn gloves, but too bad. I also probably should have in general been more careful, but uh, you know, it's fine. At this point, I was basically doing a mad dash to finish whatever I possibly could before literally running out of the door to go on my weekend trip to visit Abby. Part of the whole reason that I made this project was that she invited me to come visit for a renaissance fair near her and I was in the mood to make something new and fun. When I arrived, first we went off to pick up some new hair dye to match my hair to my new project. And although she knew that I was making armor of some kind, she didn't know any more specifics. So I, I asked her what she maybe thought I was making. It's either like so extremely historical that you're like, man, that's fucking badass. Or it's like, I used a soda can, a used McDonald's wrapper, and some plastic I found on the side of the road. And look at this cool thing I made! <laughs> After some local dog sniffs, I did need to finish up the very last little bit of armor by taking in each of these panels and adding a bit of leather, sort of connecting each one. I, I also apparently made a little bit of a mess with the leather dye earlier on, but Let's just think of that as an aesthetic weathering choice that was definitely totally on purpose. I had just 18 more rivets to go before it was done enough to wear. I did make sure to bring all of the necessary tools like the hammers and such to finish this out and these last little bits I even had a little bit of sweet canine company at the end there which I appreciate. Then we went to the fair and had a lovely time visiting the merchants, eating tasty food, listening to the singers, and watching shows. There's a lovely joust taking place right here in the background with this cinder block building that is meant to look like a castle, which I appreciate as a continued blending of modern and historical into it. Also, Nicole brought a temporary tattoo kit with her, so I figured I would just really lean into my kind of accidental celestial theme lately. It's, it's a lot of fun. I Hopefully she will talk a little bit more about it on her channel, so definitely go check that out. All in all, this was so much fun, but oh my goodness, were there some rough patches. Like, I feel like I usually have some thoughts on at the end of a project about how I would make it better. 
uh, what I would do next time if I were to try something similar again, what advice I might have for anybody else wanting to try something in that same vein. But for this, I almost want to say don't try it. Obviously, do whatever you want. If you feel inspired, man, go for it. It was just a darn pain the whole way through. I feel like I used materials to do something that those materials desperately <laughs> did not want to do. It was also super expensive. Each of these Kevlar panels was not cheap. Like, I, I love it. I love it as a finished conceptual piece, but oh boy, <laughs> uh, it was a challenge all around. Like, the, the Kevlar did not want to be cut cleanly. I think you're supposed to use a water jet machine to, to cut it out, but I don't have that, so I had to make do. It took me a while uh, to figure out how to do the, the holes for all the rivets because just drilling it wasn't enough. The carbon fiber and Kevlar fabric that I, I used on the surface here is absolutely not meant to be made into clothes. I seriously thought that I was completely done for there. The fact that I ended up finding an iron-on vinyl and, and that it, for the most part, worked. The emotional roller coaster I went through that day from receiving the fabric and it's absolutely gorgeous, but then, oh my god, is this completely unusable? And then finding something that made me go, oh, 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 I might actually be able to make this work. Like, <sighs> and lastly, the rivets. I didn't think they were going to be so difficult. And yet, that was, that was a whole nother roller coaster because the first like 50 rivets that I did were terrible. Full stop. Just absolutely awful. And then about halfway through, I kind of started figuring out a good system for them, like how long to cut the shank underneath and what type of careful tapping to do to, and what kind of surface I needed to work on that made a big difference. It just took a lot of trial and error before they started looking kind of decent. On the plus side though, I feel like I've absolutely leveled up my my riveting skill and I, I guess that's kind of what this all comes down to. Sometimes you try something new and it goes surprisingly smoothly and sometimes it super heckin doesn't. <laughs> but it was a really fun challenge and while it's not quite what I had originally envisioned, I'm, I'm pretty dang proud of the end results. And I felt so incredibly cool walking around the fair that day. Well, like not cool in the sense of like cold because it was very hot and you would not believe how many people asked me like, are you hot in that? <laughs> Anywho, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all next time.